At the end of the last episode, we'd installed some Unix tools for Mint. And I said I was going to go away, and that in this episode, I was going to add some extra packages, and then we'd move on from there. And one of my goals was to improve the workflow for my What's New page on my machine image. Now, I've installed the tools, and as you can see, from where we were last week, things have improved. I've got N cursors installed, and I can clear the screen. And more importantly, full screen editing is now a thing. I can also run Make, which is a tool that I need to build my homepage. Now, when the last video was released, AtStorm made the following comment. I see you've installed Unix apps on a TOS file system. I assume you most likely know that you could have used an ext2 partition if you wanted to. I wonder if there are any drawbacks to doing this. I'm thinking along the lines of Unix permissions that don't exist on TOS file systems, etc. And also, ext2 does have a handy file integrity checker, whereas I don't know if there's one for TOS, as a Mint utility that is. I certainly see the benefit of having access to the Unix apps from TOS and Gem, though mainly for obtaining and maintaining outside of Mint. It's a really good comment, and it got me to thinking. As far as the weaknesses of using Mint commands under a TOS file system, well, let's do a bit of pretend, shall we? Let's pretend I can't remember what parameters the make command takes. So let's use the man command to find out. Now, strangely, it says no manual entry for make. Now, this confuses me because I swear it's in user share man man1. So let's take a look there. And indeed, there are manual pages in that folder. And in fact, there's the man page for make. I can see it. It's up there. And I wonder what could be the issue. So how do you debug a problem like that? So let's make use of the make command to debug itself. And we'll learn a few Unix commands along the way if you're not familiar with Unix itself. So invoking the man command with the minus D flag, lowercase, gives me debug information. But if you notice, stuff scrolled off the screen. So let's try out putting man and piping that into the more command to page it. And that didn't work. And that's because it's writing debug output to standard error. And the more page is standard out. So there are three main file streams in, in Unix. There's standard in, which is your input stream, standard out and standard error. And they are for inputting text to an application, outputting general information and outputting error information. And why do they have two output streams? Well, if you think what we're going to be doing here is piping the output of one command into another into another. So if you do that, obviously that output's not going to appear on the console because it's being piped to the next command. But if there's an error in that process, you really want to see it. So the error gets piped separately to the console. But if you want to page both, what I'm going to do is redirect standard error to standard out, and then more will page both of them. So to do this, we're going to use the syntax two greater and one. And that tells the command to redirect standard error, which is stream two, to standard out, which is stream one. And when we pipe the unified text into more, it'll page it. So the most important thing here is that it's looking in the right places. There's user share man here in the paths, so that's where our files are. And I had a look at this man.config file just to see if the contents look sane, and they absolutely did. So let's next try running make with the verbose debug option, which is minus capital D. So it starts with the same info as before, but then it starts outputting verbose information on where it's looking for files. And again, it seems to be looking in all the right places. So it looks in user share man, etc. Now, looking at these different things, there's a little sub expression inside some of these lines containing the details that I want. And that's things that have the text will expand in it. So I'm going to use the grep command, which will take its input line by line and only output lines that match a pattern that you specify. And here I'm going to specify the pattern will expand. Well, actually, will exp. That's enough. We'll pipe that reduced output into more. So here we can see what it's actually looking for. And this is quite interesting to me. It's looking for user share man HTML1 make.1.html. Now it's not going to find that because it's not there. We don't have HTML man pages. So next it's going to look for user share man man1 make.1 star. So does that exist? I don't know, but I thought it should do, because I'm pretty sure when we were unpacking those archives, I saw that fly by. 
But if we do an, an LS for that pattern, what we get is no file or directory. Hmm. OK, let's try looking for make star in that folder. And there we have make.gz. So why did that happen? Well, I think when the tar file was extracted, it tried to create make.1.gz. But our Mint installation is built on top of a TOS file system. And that has a limitation that file names have a maximum length of eight characters with a three letter extension. So when tar extracted this file, or rather when it used the file system access libraries to do that, they remapped the file name. They took the original extension of .gz and then rejected the bit in the middle of what it saw as kind of an extra extension of .1 and just used the original file name and then created a file called make.gz. Well, that's kind of enough of an idea of how things work. It's, it's nowhere near exactly totally true. Now, of course, make.gz will never match the pattern that man is using. So is that all of the problems that keep man from working? Man is a very complicated command that relies on other apps to function. So it, it uses gunzip to decompress the file. It uses nrof or trof or grof to process the files. And then it uses less or more to page them. So we need to determine that we've actually narrowed this down to the one issue that we have. So I'm going to quickly go to the man one folder. I'm going to decompress make.gz. I'm going to rename it to make.1. And we know that make.1 will match the wildcard make.1 star. So now if I say man make, it works. So we know exactly what the problem was. It was, as Storm suggested, the 8.3 file system. So the partial example to his question is, this is an example of the sort of things that can happen when running Mint on TOS. They also mentioned ex2fs as a file system. So what's that? So ext is a file system developed for Linux. It's a flexible, iNode-based, non-journal file system that supports functionality that Mint can use to provide more Unix-like experiences. It supports a maximum file name size of 255 characters, which is somewhat better than 8.3. And the file names can include any character apart from the null character, which is zero, and the path separator forward slash. So you pretty free form. The theoretical max volume size is two terabytes. Now that is just for the very first version of EX2FS. Later versions actually went higher. I say theoretically, because I don't know if anybody back in the day actually would ever have put a two terabyte drive on an Atari. I really do doubt it. Although nowadays with modern SD cards, it's a possibility. And the maximum file size that you can create for a single file is 16 gigabytes. Again, in later versions that went higher. Now take this with a pinch of salt because I just looked these up on Wikipedia. So as usual, it'll be as accurate as Wikipedia is. But all in all, ext2 is a much more modern file system implementation than TOS. And what I want to be able to do is add an ext2 file system to our Atari, reinstall the command line tools to that drive, and then hopefully when we extract it under a proper Unix file system, it'll correctly untar the man pages with the .1.gz extensions. I'm going to point Mint to those files instead of the old ones on TOS. And then I'm going to deal with potential issues from incorrect shutdown of Mint by adding a proper shutdown command, which you don't have yet, and then running a file system check at boot up if necessary. Currently, our Mint Emutos instance has a single hard drive with a TOS partition on it. I'm going to add a second virtual hard drive of the same size and format that as ext2. Right, I'm here on my host machine where I run Hatari. And I'm in my hard drive folder. I already have the standard 5.1.12.img file that you guys might be utterly familiar with by now if you've been following this series since the beginning. And this is our 512 megabyte TOS partition. I want to create a partition that's going to become our ext2 drive. And I'm going to create that using dd as follows. So I'm running the dd command with an input file, if of dev0 which just provides an infinite stream of bytes to the value of zero, writing to an output file using the OF parameter called drive-1.image. I'm using a block size of 512 bytes and writing a count of 1,048,576 blocks. And that's going to create a single file of 512 megabytes containing just zeros. Now, as part of this, I'm going to move 512.image to drive0.image. And later, when we're using these two drives together, we'll mount them using IDE or SCSI and 
using devices 0 and 1 and device 0 will be C and device 1 will be D. Now to use our new device, we need to partition it and set the partition type to raw and then format it. To safely partition the drive, I've gone into Atari and made a few changes. I've created an ST with a stock 68000 running at 8 MHz. The partition software we're going to use, ICD Pro, doesn't seem to like running on non-stock hardware. Now, for a hard drive, I've mounted my new drive image as ASCI Drive Zero. And the reason I've not mounted anything else is I don't want a bit of fat-fingered typing blowing away the wrong drive. That would just be... I mean, I've got backups, but come on, we don't want to be silly. I've created a floppy disk that just has ICD Pro in it, and I've put that in Drive A. So let's reboot, and as Emutos comes up, I'm pressing the A key, which will then get it to boot from Drive A. And it's booting from the floppy, and you can see the ICD Pro logo. And once on the desktop, let's open Drive A. Partitioning is a simple process. We run icdformat.prg, and I've sped this up just to make it load faster. Pressing any key goes into the SCSI detection page, which we don't have any. Now we choose our Drive Zero. Now on this screen, there's a very important option to change, and that's to click on Verify Passes and set it to None. Otherwise, after partitioning, you're going to wait hours, and I really mean hours, for it to check for bad sectors and bad blocks on the disk. And there won't be any, because it's virtual. So next we click Partition. And helpfully, it seems to suggest 17 partitions, so we're going to clear that list, and use the Split option to split the disk into one partition. And then the final thing here is to click the partition type and enter raw. We click on partition the entire disk and then we confirm the scary messages about blowing everything away. Then we OK, cancel and quit out of the program. So back in Hatari, we've reset our machine to be a Falcon. The CPU is a 68040 at 32 megahertz and I've ejected the floppy disk. Now hard drives. I've set up disk0.img as our SCSI device 0 and disk1.image as our SCSI device 1. So now let's reboot again and go into the Genie desktop. We have our new disk connected to the Falcon and here it is showing in root as D. However, if we try to list the files on it, it'll tell us it's not a directory. And that's because we haven't formatted it yet. And to format it, we'll use the command mke2fs. So there's its usage. And we just run it as mke2fsd colon. Now it says it can't check that it's mounted because we're missing an mtab file. That's fine. It gives us the usual dire warning that this will zap the contents of the D drive, and we say yes. And in a very, very small amount of time, it's done. So let's do a list of slash D again. And there we see the root of our shiny new ext file system with a single folder named lost and found. Reminds me of a meatloaf song. So the lost and found folder is used to recover files that were not properly closed. And this can happen if the power fails or if you shut down Mint incorrectly. In other words, you just reset the machine rather than doing a clean shutdown. And I have mentioned the need to shut down our systems properly before, but now we're using ext2fs. This is really important. So I think we need to do two things here. We need to install a proper shutdown command and start using tooling to check our file system for problem files and moving them into lost and found if there's an issue at boot zone. Okay, so currently if we try to shut down the system using Ginny's shutdown menu, we get the following error. So I've copied a shutdown program into my Gemsys folder. Let's configure Ginny to use that command. So we're going to go into C, Gemsys, and locate our shutdown command. Now I found this particular implementation of shutdown on a floppy shop disk and it appears to do the job. It came with Pascal source for it, and what it does is iterate all open processes and sends them a SIG term message, allowing them to safely close down their files and exit. Now also, while we're in the preferences, I'm gonna go into drives and unhide drive D. So now on the desktop, we get access to our D drive, which is good. We're gonna save our desktop, and we're gonna test our shutdown command. Genie is not 100% comfortable with my AES, I don't think. It always pops up this little error dialog and you need to click Tolerate, but it works. To run the file system check at boot that will hoover up all the files that were not correctly shut down and put them into lost and found, we're going to edit mint.config. So let's scroll to the section where there are a couple of examples of running the file system check command. I'm going to delete those examples and we're going to add our own. And we're going to add exec 
u slash bin slash e2 fsk minus capital C zero minus p d colon. So minus c space zero tells e2 fsk to display progress in like a progress bar on there in text, and minus p tells the command to automatically repair as it goes. p means preen in this case. Now if we look in the root of our C drive, we have the C4F root folder that we created in the last video to store our Unix commands. And we see within that the folders that host our Unix, Sbin and user hierarchies. We want to put these under our D drive, but I mean just dragging and dropping them would be pointless as the files and folders on drive C have already been mangled when untarred on a TOS file system. So I'm going to untar these files again from the original sources on drive D and skip over all of that really. Right, so here's that unzip command running and the video being sped up a lot. <laughs> and I mean a lot. Once done, if we list the root of D, we see the folders bin, etc, lost and found, sbin and user. In the bin folder, we discussed in the last episode, those files have already been copied to the right locations in the sysroot folder, so I'm going to get rid of that. Now etc is interesting. If we look in there, there's a file mk2fs.conf. So it has a long file extension. On the C drive, in the current etc folder, we have a truncated version of that file name and the password and profile files. So I'm going to make the executive decision to move those two files over from the C to D, and then we're going to replace the current mount point for etc with one point into the D drive. And obviously we're going to need the point slash user slash s bin to D as well. And before we do that, let's just have a quick look at user share man man one and make sure that the man files look good. And they do. To move our mounted folders over from the C drive to the D drive, we need to edit mint.config. So first of all, a little bit of tidy ups needed. I'm going to just move any of the bits that I've previously changed into one area. So there's our current entries for slash sbin and slash user together. Now I'm going to move the entry for slash etc down here as well, because we're going to move that to D. And now we map D slash etc to u slash etc, d slash sbin to u slash sbin, and d slash user to u slash user. Looking at these template lines up here, it might be worth moving some of these other folders to our D drive at some point. Home is an interesting one, as currently our home folder is set to slash root, and I think it would be nice to have it not be in that folder. Something for the future though, I think. So let's pop in a cheeky reboot. And I'll freeze here and you can see that our FSCK check is passing as we shut down correctly. Again, ignore the mtab line. I'll fix that some other day. Now I'm going to do a deliberate unsafe reboot so we can see what happens. And indeed, there we go, a force check. You can see nice progress bar. So once we're on the desktop, let's have a look in lost and found and see if we can see anything else was recovered. And nothing was, which is a good thing. Now these tests will run quite a bit. One thing that often causes swearing here at C4F towers is that copy on a Mac is command C. And can I guess what the command for an Atari for a cold reboot is? Yep, it's the same. So if I forget to use control C in QED, and sometimes I do, well, sulfurous swearing ensues, followed by an FSCK check. I, I know I could remap the, the keys, but I keep forgetting. So sanity check time. Does this fix our original issue with make? And yes, it does. And that fills me with deep joy. Nice. Now in Storm's original comments, in addition to ext2, he also said that he saw the benefit of having access to the Unix app from TOS Gem, although mainly for updating and maintaining outside of Mint. And that got me to thinking about how we get files into and out from Mint, especially when we go through a TOS partition that can mangle names. So next time I want to investigate how we might use a third hard drive type of VFAT stroke FAT32 to achieve that and the tooling available on the host side to help. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching and I will talk to you soon.